Center at the Center of Autism and Related Disorders at Kennedy Krieger Institute. And um, today we are gonna be sharing a little bit about the gut and brain connection autism with Dr. Calliope Holing. Um, she is a faculty member at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And she recently completed her postdoctoral training at Kennedy Krieger Institute. She's trained as a psychiatric epidemiologist and received her PhD in mental health from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in 2019. Prior to that, she received her molecular cell biology and public health and her MPH in epidemiology and biostatistics from U University of California, Berkeley. One of her main research objectives is to understand the interplay between physical and mental health among individuals with autism in order to promote the health of this population. She is particularly interested in the gut-brain axis in autism, which she'll be speaking about today. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Holing. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you to everyone for registering and, and joining. Um, as Megan said, my, my name is Calliope and please call me Calliope. Um, and uh, just to give you a brief sense of what we're gonna be talking about today. First, I'd like to describe potential pathways linking GI symptoms or gut dysregulation with autism. Um, we're gonna learn about some of the latest gut microbiome research in autism. And then um, a good chunk of the presentation, I'm gonna to try to focus on um, identifying approaches to um, identifying or recognizing and managing GI symptoms in people with autism. And then we'll have a Q&A section um, and thank you for sending your questions in advance. Um, and I'll, um, I'll answer some of the questions that uh, came up that were really popular and then um, hopefully we'll have time for, for other ones as well. Um, so, uh, and then I also wanna mention that uh, I, I, I will be talking about Spark and how Spark is able to leverage, um, you know, the amazing data set from, um, from families like you to answer questions that are relevant to the gut brain access. Um, and then also just a quick administrative note is that I know the slides were sent to you in advance. The ones I'll present are slightly different, but I'll make sure to, um, to circulate this final draft so you have everything you need. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, why, why should we care about autism and GI symptoms? And I think maybe this is less, uh, this is more obvious to you if you're, if you're tuning in, but in brief, GI symptoms are very common in this population of children and adults with autism. Some of the most common symptoms are constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain or discomfort. And it's estimated that about 50% or maybe even more um, individuals with autism actually have one or more of these GI symptoms on a somewhat chronic basis. Um, and so it's affecting a lot of people. It's also common for things like food sensitivities or preferences, mealtime difficulties, toileting problems uh, to occur, to co-occur with I apologize, I think I muted myself for a, sec for a second. So it's common for these sorts of things to co-occur with GI symptoms. Um, but that being said, there's no current evidence that there is a specific autism gut pathology. And what I mean by that is, it seems that people with autism are more likely to experience the, G the sort of GI symptoms that any typically developing person would. So there's no sort of autism specific gut issue, it's more of um, an increased frequency of all the issues that, that we typically see in the general or typically developing, developing population. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, GI symptoms uh, often co-occur with other conditions. Um, and so beyond the, the diet and the feeding and the mealtime issues, um, they can co-occur um, or be associated with behavioral symptoms, stress, anxiety, um, even some biomarkers like cortisol, which is um, really a key measure of our stress response, and then some actual disorders such as um, seizure disorders or sleep disorders can also be associated with GI dysfunction. So 
So as you can see here, the GI symptoms are not only common, but they're associated with quite a few things. I also want to touch on um, a qualitative study that I worked on um, or I conducted as part of my dissertation work. And here I was really interested in understanding what the experiences are that children um, and their families uh, face that have autism and these co-occurring GI symptoms. And so what we did is we advertised this qualitative study to local autism groups in the Baltimore DC area. We recruited parents of a child with autism that had a history of these GI symptoms. Um, and sometimes the child, um, whether that was a, a child or an adult um, of the parent, would also participate. We, cut, we conducted uh, 12 interviews and we did what's called an inductive analysis, which means we looked at the actual text data um, that people were saying, the actual words that they were using, and we used their actual words to determine what are the important themes or patterns that people are saying. Um, and we do this to make sure that um, that's, that's a very organic process, that the things that we're learning really come from the people that we're talking to rather than our own preconceived notions um, as a researcher. And so I'll just briefly touch on some of the things we found. The first theme, um, and I'll come back to this later in the presentation in more detail, is that children with autism um, and adults often have difficulty verbally communicating their presence of GI symptoms. Um, so oftentimes parents would tell us, you know, I, I can't really tell if my child is having GI symptoms because he or she, um, you know, either isn't talking to me or doesn't, uh, doesn't share that with me or isn't able to. This was really the most common thing and, and it was pretty much universal across these interviews. The second theme is that these GI issues impacted the child's well being, their ability to participate in and really engage in all sorts of activities. This included school, um, ability to focus in class ability to engage in social activities or extracurricular activities, the child's emotional and overall well-being. And this parent, for example, wrote, um, when her child is not right in the gut, the whole world isn't right. Um, and a lot of his behaviors and his other issues crop up when he's constipated. He'll get in trouble more. He'll have issues at school. So these GI symptoms really impact his daily life in many ways. And this was, um, this was a common theme across, uh, across the participants. And then the third theme was that um, the child's GI issues also impacted the family. Um, and so if you're here, you, you likely have, uh, many of you may have a sense of this, is that the overall temperament um, and well-being of the household was affected. Parents were more distressed and frustrated because they couldn't figure out maybe how to help their children. Um, it affected the family's ability to go out, sometimes even the financial health um, and financial stress of the family. And I think this quote captures that quite well. Um, this parent is saying it's painful to have to try and do something that's uncomfortable or out of the norm for your child um, because they don't really care for it. And so here they were talking about having to administer a medication, I believe a suppository in particular, something that the child needed, but it was really uncomfortable. And the parent was just so distressed about having to do this thing for the GI symptoms that, that the child was not tolerating well. And then um, the last major theme was that parents often experience challenges with uh, seeking accessible and quality health care um, for their child. And this was not only their child's health care in general, but specifically the GI symptoms. And so some of the things that came up were the fact that to make a health care appointment, it was a really lengthy and complicated process. Um, once an appointment was made and they went to the doctor's office, those medical office settings were really not conducive um, to the child because, per, uh, for example, um, it was a really loud and bright and um, and there were there were lots of kind of sensory um, sensory things that uh, that upset the child. Uh, a lot of times healthcare providers didn't necessarily have the experience or the training to treat this population with these complex medical needs. Um, and even un unfortunately, in some cases, parents felt they, they weren't taken seriously by healthcare providers 
due to their child having autism. Um, and I'll share an example of that in just a moment. And, and then there were consequences of these challenges. So as you can imagine, if you're a parent and you're experiencing all these barriers um, in, in trying to get your, your child uh, treated for, for GI problems, uh, you may start going to the physician less you may start trying some things at home and kind of troubleshooting on your own. That has a lot of um, downstream implications. And uh, just to give you just a final example of this, this theme about the difficulties with uh, getting healthcare, this parent says, I think that some of the issues that happen are more complex. Um, they, as in the physician or the healthcare provider, are expecting a child to come in with a fever, um, figure out the cause of that fever, whether or not they need medication, and that's the end of it. But, but we, the family, have a lot of ongoing issues, things that may affect other things. It's just more complex. So a lot of families, unfortunately, felt that they, um, you know, they, they couldn't find providers that really were used to dealing with this level of complexity in this population. So I hope that by just presenting you with that data, if you weren't convinced already, hopefully you are convinced now that this is a really important issue. Uh, and, and this is why this is one of the main areas that I focus on is because I think it's common, it's distressing um, to the whole community um, and, and there's a lot of work to be done. So the second thing I'd like to talk about is why we see um, GI symptoms uh, elevated in people with autism. So the first thing is that having autism may in itself increase GI symptoms. And there are a lot of ways that this can happen. Some of the ways are um, co-occurring conditions. So we know that children with autism, for example, are more likely to have um, psychiatric conditions, uh, sleep conditions, perhaps seizure, epilepsy, uh, sensory issues, and all of these things may in turn affect the GI system. Um, similarly, medications taken for those conditions may also affect GI, GI issues. So for example, it's possible that a medication taken for a psychiatric or behavioral health condition may cause constipation, um, or it's possible that the, um, the sensory preferences or sensitivities that are that are commonly co-occur with autism um, may lead children to uh, to avoid particular foods. And so um, these dietary restrictions are another ways in which GI symptoms can occur because if you have someone that is not really interested or able to eat any vegetables, then of course their fiber intake is gonna be affected and that has important implications for gut health. So I think those are some of the main reasons in which, uh, by which the autism um, and things associated with the autism can affect GI health. Conversely, um, it's also possible that GI symptoms or gut dysfunction could also be influencing autism or the co-occurring conditions and behaviors that we typically see in autism. So what I mean by this is first, um, any of us, regardless of whether we have autism or not, um, are I think familiar with the idea that if we're not feeling well in our belly, we're gonna be uncomfortable, perhaps just stressed, we may be even feeling pain, and those things are gonna make us irritable and perhaps snappy, even anxious or depressed. Um, and, and so in a person with autism, this may be compounded because if the person is not able to verbally communicate what they're experiencing and get help for those symptoms, then they're really gonna rely on behavior in order to communicate that distress. And so I think unfortunately, some of the time, the behaviors that we see um, children and adults with autism uh, display may really just be manifestations or indicators of the fact that they're experiencing some, some sort of medical, uh, medical discomfort or pain. So I think that's important to, to remember. And then the second part is what I've loosely just termed here biology. Um, so there are things, biological mechanisms that happen in the gut, um, such as the gut microbiome, that may actually be affecting brain and behavior. Um, and I'll get to some of those specifics in the next portion of this talk. So in terms of the latest autism gut microbiome research, I want to first begin with just a little bit of history about the topic. Um, as you may know, there have been 
um, some anecdotal reports of young children who developed regressive autism after repeated exposures to antibiotics for, for things like ear infections. Um, and then some reporting that eradication of specific bacteria, so if, for example, cluster uh, dialysis, excuse me, um, through additional antibiotics may sometimes improve those symptoms. So it's those sort of anecdotal, anecdotal reports that started to get the research community paying attention and saying, okay, maybe there's a, a gut component here. Um, and so one of uh, the major studies that have occurred because of this um, happened in 2000, and this was an open label clinical trial um, with children that had regressive autism. And the children took an eight week course of vancomycin, which is a broad spectrum antibiotic, and then four weeks of oral probiotics. And most of the children actually showed behavioral improvements. Um, however, within two weeks of that antibiotic um, being stopped, there was subsequent deterioration in those behavioral improvements. Um, so here, some, some really intriguing evidence that, okay, maybe, maybe by giving antibiotics or probiotics in some of these kids, we may actually help improve not only GI symptoms, but behavior. Um, I apologize, I'm seeing this text is a little small. Um, in addition, we see lots of different um, gut microbiome alterations in autism. So for example, some individuals with autism have distinct bacterial species, um, here again, clostridial, relative to neurotypical controls. And, and we see that the amount of those bacteria can actually be associated with both the autism and the GI symptoms. Um, now we know from biological studies, in particular animal studies, that cluster dialysis can actually produce neurotoxic metabolites. There is a potential pathway um, by which these sort of um, bacterial changes could actually influence not only the gut, but the brain and development. However, this is still very preliminary. Um, it's most more kind of more of a hypothesis at this point, but this is one of the bacterial species that researchers and clinicians are looking more, more into. Um, and then, as I said, there are multiple types of microbiota um, or you know, bacteria, viruses, fungi that have been associated with autism. Um, and most of these findings come from the pediatric population. There's uh, unfortunately at this point much less that we know about adults. Um, but across this literature, the findings are really highly divergent, um, highly inconsistent with some studies finding differences in one microbe and other studies finding differences in a separate microbe. Sometimes the studies even um, conflicting with each other. And there are a few reasons for these discrepancies. First of all is the research so far has been in pretty small cohorts um, and they use different comparison groups. So for example, some studies use unrelated control, uh, control individuals and other studies use siblings that don't have autism. Um, the studies differ in terms of the variables or confounders that they adjust for. So sometimes taking into account the differences in diet and antibiotic and medications, um, but other studies may not do that. We also know, of course, that there's heterogeneity within the autism population. So we don't necessarily expect um, for there to be one single type of microbiome uh, dysregulation or imbalance to be present in all individuals with autism. It's likely gonna be in a subset. Um, and for that reason, it's also hard to find consistent findings. Um, and then, of course, there are also variations in terms of the laboratory and analytical techniques, where the study is done, what kind of um, bio sample is used. So for all of these reasons, it's been hard so far to really pinpoint what microbes seem to be associated with these GI and autism behaviors. Um, but thankfully, um, the more the, these, these initial studies come out, the more we get um, the ability to, to do larger studies and to, and, and to improve upon the quality and, and, and to learn more. Um, but, but this is just very much sort of a, a new area. Um, and then I also just wanna mention that 
There's also the possibility that the gut may be involved in the development of autism. So we know that the maternal gut microbiome, meaning the microbiome of a pregnant woman, um, actually interacts with her immune system during pregnancy. A lot of this research comes from animal models that show that this interaction between the maternal gut microbiome and immune system can actually influence the development of the child's brain um, and behavior. These studies are, uh, of course, much harder to do in humans, but there is research that's going on to try to replicate these findings and, um, and see how much this holds true in humans and the specifics of that. Um, but, but the key point here is that there are some early life exposures, things like how the baby was delivered, um, diet uh, and breastfeeding, medications, things that really shape the development of the microbiome in the early life. Um, and there's a lot of work underway to try to understand how these early life exposures affect not only the child's health um, in terms of their gut, but also the child's neurodevelopment and behavior. Um, in terms of the types of interventions that we can use to actually manipulate um, the microbiome, uh, diet is really one of the biggest things. So we know that uh, people's microbiome, the types of bacteria that they have in their gut, really depends on the types of diet that they have. And so for that reason, these, um, these dietary interventions actually hold a lot of promise. That being said, we also know that different diet or microbial interventions kind of vary across people in terms of how effective they are. So again, it may not be one single sort of therapy or intervention that works, but a combination of things and maybe the combination depends on the particular person. So that's the sort of thing that we're trying to learn more about. Some of the common microbial therapies though are antibiotics. Uh, probiotics, and if you haven't heard this term, probiotics are simply the live, uh, the actual live active beneficial bacteria. Um, these can be found in foods like yogurt, miso, or fermented vegetables, lots of other foods as well. Um, prebiotics, these are actually the foods for the probiotics. So these are the things that the probiotics actually eat in order to multiply and, um, and thrive inside the gut. These things include things like garlic, bananas, and oats, um, and even uh, fecal transplants or fecal microbiota transplants, which I'll talk about in just a second. So fecal transplants, if you're not familiar, these are um, actually came out of the uh, the C. difficile infection world. Um, these were developed because some people with recurring um, infections from C. difficile simply weren't getting better. Their microbiota was completely wiped out. And um, researchers and clinicians uh, experimented with trying to restore a healthy balance by taking um, donor from a, a, excuse me, taking feces or stool from a healthy donor and actually transferring that to the gut of the patient. And they saw a lot of success in treating this treatment resistant C. diff. And so now we're starting to see fecal transplants being used in other conditions, um, a lot of inflammatory bowel disease, but even some psychiatric and neurodevelopmental conditions. And, and I'll talk more specifically about um, autism in just a second. But in brief, what happens is we take these feces from a healthy donor. There's a number um, of processing steps to, uh, to mix uh, the, the sample and blend it and filter it and make sure it's um, kind of as pure as possible. And it's just the, um, as much as possible, just the, the microbes um, and not kind of extraneous uh, biomaterial. And then that can be delivered in a few ways, um, either endoscopy, this can be either via mouth or rectally. Um, and there are even some pills that are being developed, um, which is, I think, for many people, a little bit more um, of a feasible and maybe acceptable way, um, less invasive, certainly, to, to uh, take this therapy. And so I just want to touch on um, a study that has come out. Um, the first study here on top came out in 2017, and their follow-up study came out in 2019. 
Um, and I believe this is the only um, group so far to have published on these fecal transplants or microbiota transplants um, in autism. Um, and I'm happy to, to answer some more questions about this specifically. But um, briefly, the purpose was to assess whether this uh, a modified fecal microbiota transplant or FMT, whether that was safe and tolerable in the autism population, and second, uh, secondarily, whether it improved GI and autism symptoms. So this was an open label clinical trial, meaning they had a treatment group and they had a control group, but um, the treatment group was children with autism and there was no control group of children with autism. It was actually typically developing children. Um, the study wasn't blinded. There was no randomizing to interventions. So that's what we mean by open label. Um, and I can speak more about that, more about that later if it's helpful. But as I said, the, the treatment group was 18 children with autism. These children had moderate to severe GI problems. Um, they ranged from seven to, seven to 16 years old. And the control group, these are people who did not receive the intervention. These were 20 typically developing children. They did not have GI disorders, but they had the same age and sex as the treatment group. The intervention was a two-week course of vancomycin, broad-spectrum antibiotic, MoviPrep, which is something that essentially flushes out um, the, the bowel. It's used in preparation for things like en uh, endoscopies. It's, it's essentially a bowel cleanse. Um, the microbiota themselves, so this came from a healthy donor uh, stool sample, and then Prilosec, which is an acid inhibitor. And this was used to make sure that the acid in the stomach didn't kill off all of the microbes um, that, were, that were administered. So parents collected stool samples. They measured GI symptoms and autism symptoms and other global impressions in their children throughout the study. The results were that the microbiome of these children did change. So at the beginning of the study, the gut bacteria among the children with autism was much less diverse, meaning there were not as many of different types of microbes um, compared to the, uh, the control group. But at the end of the study, at the end of the treatment, it was actually similar. Um, we, they also saw that the, the donor bacterial community, meaning the actual microbiome, um, actually partially engrafted in the recipient, meaning it, it did really change the composition. And they also saw that specific bacteria um, also change with the treatment, including things like bifidobacterium and prevotella. Um, and so this was kind of the first set of findings that the microbiome does seem to change after this intervention. So that, that's hopeful. Um, and then they also found that both symptoms um, of autism as well as GI symptoms seemed to improve after the intervention. So not only did things like abdominal pain, indigestion, constipation, and diarrhea improve, um, but they also saw improvements in social responsiveness, autism severity, the parent global impression, and they found a significant negative correlation between the change in the GI and the autism scores, meaning the better, um, the more improvement in the GI symptoms, the, the more improvement in the, in the autism symptoms or behavioral symptoms. Um, and overall, the treatment was generally well tolerated, though there were some temporary adverse um, events like hyperactivity, tantrums, or aggression. So some limitations and caveats that I wanna make sure to, to convey to you is that, as I mentioned, this study was not placebo controlled, Blind, blinded or randomized. So that means that the autism group um, and their parents knew what kind of treatment that they were getting. So there is some uh, potential for a placebo reaction. Um, and we also don't know whether perhaps these changes that occurred, the improvements in GI and autism would have occurred if the treatment hadn't been given. So for that, we need um, a more rigorous study design called a randomized double-blind control study in which, um, in which we're, we essentially give children with, some children with autism get the therapy, some don't, 
and we follow up both groups and see if there's a significant difference over time. And that study is actually currently underway, but the findings haven't been published yet. Um, some other kind of caveats or things to consider is that the treatment had a lot of different parts, right? It had the antibiotic, it had that bowel cleanse, the acid inhibitor, as well as that microbiota transplant. And so it's not clear whether it was all parts of this that were necessary or only some parts. Um, so that remains to be seen. Um, as I've alluded to, the assessment of GI symptoms in this population is challenging. And so because these are very subjective um, symptoms, it's possible that um, some people who experienced uh, reductions in these symptoms or even deterioration in these symptoms, uh, that wasn't measured accurately. And another thing to consider is that, as I said, autism is a very heterogeneous condition. So just because we saw some improvements in this specific population doesn't mean we'd see those improvements in, in any child uh, with autism. And so the questions I think that are kind of outstanding um, are whether the improvements in the autism symptoms are due to the microbiota or the microbes themselves influencing the brain, or was it that these microbiota actually reduced GI symptoms and now the child is feeling better because their belly is feeling better? Um, so these are the th sort of things that are, you know, outstanding questions that remain to be seen. But um, I think it's an important study to share because it was, um, it is the first of its kind and, um, and uh, you know, does, does hold some promise, I think. So the next thing I want to talk about is identifying and managing GI symptoms. And I know there were lots of questions um, from you about this sort of thing. So I will do my best to kind of cover some of the main things in the talk, and then I can talk more about this in the Q&A. Um, so first, just a couple reminders is that, as I said, autism is heterogeneous, so there's not going to be a single cause of autism. And similarly, there's not going to be a single cause of GI symptoms or GI dysfunction in autism. Um, there may be a subset of people with autism in which the gut is implicated and does affect their autism, but that doesn't mean it's everyone. Um, and that has really important implications for the etiology um, and treatments and preventative therapies. Um, because if it's not one single thing that is affecting these GI symptoms, then that means there are a lot of potential things that work for different people. That makes the research more challenging. Um, and that's why it's, you know, there's no so far like smoking gun or, or magic bullet um, that, that shows us what the single thing is. It's going to differ across people. And then I just want to make a disclaimer that I'm not a medical doctor. Um, my, my PhD is in epidemiology, which is research. Um, so I'm going to be sharing uh, strategies based off of the best available evidence that's out there. Um, but I'm going to encourage you to reach out to a medical provider that you trust before starting before starting anything or changing anything with yourself or your child or anyone else. Um, so in terms of identifying GI symptoms, I spoke at the beginning about this qualitative study that I, um, that I conducted in which we were talking to families with a child with autism and co-occurring symptoms. Um, and I alluded to this first theme that children with autism often had difficulty verbally communicating the presence of their GI symptoms. And so a little bit more about this is that even the parents of children with autism that had fluent speech and parents may have described as like, oh, he's always talking, like he has no problems with talking. Um, even those children often experienced challenges, challenges in communicating when they were experiencing GI symptoms. So it's not just an issue with children who are hypo or nonverbal. Um, the second is that parents reported having to rely on bodily signs to identify when their child was experiencing GI symptoms. So these bodily signs are things like, um, like gas or diarrhea, or perhaps the child not having a bowel movement for a full week. Um, when the parent noticed those sorts of things, that was an indicator that, okay, my, my child is probably not feeling um, very well in their, in their belly. And then the second type of thing is that uh, parents also had to, to rely on these nonverbal behaviors. And I'll talk more about this in a second. But these are things, for example, like irritability um, that 
it's it's not the child saying, oh, my my, my belly hurts, my tummy hurts, um, but it's showing up in, in, in their behavior. And sometimes parents have to use that to recognize when their child is experiencing GI distress. So as I, as I mentioned, this is an issue in even verbal children. And so this parent is saying um, her child is verbal to the extent where he can talk to you about things, um, but when it's something about his body or his feelings or anything that makes him uncomfortable, he doesn't have any words for it. Um, the, the second issue is use of these bodily signs to detect these symptoms. And so this parent is saying her child had GI symptoms starting as a baby, and she would literally just put her hand on his stomach and she could feel everything moving and growling. He had severe gas. You could see it in his movements. Um, sometimes she, she'd have to take him to the doctor to actually assist with taking out the, the dried out stool because it was no longer moving through his system. So her baby and her child wasn't, um, it wasn't telling her, of course, you know, my belly hurts, but she was noticing it based, based off of the bodily signs. Um, and then the second type of indicator, as I mentioned, are these nonverbal behaviors. So this parent is saying that her child gets angry, short, um, semi-belligerent, um, which is very atypical of him. Um, and then it turns out he actually just had to go to the bathroom. Um, but, you know, if she had asked him, do you need to go to the bathroom? The child would have said like, no, I'm fine. I don't need to go. Um, so again, here, this disconnect um, in, in communication, but also the use of this kind of these behavioral, uh, these uh, behavioral strategies to communicate when, when the child is, is in, in distress. Um, and this is a really, um, this is a really poignant example, really difficult to read, but um, in this case, the, the child would, um, would even scream or throw things, um, and sometimes the police even had to be called because she was being really destructive. And as soon as she'd calm down, she would say, my tummy hurts. So at the beginning, there was no verbal communication that her belly was bothering her, and that's why she was upset. Um, and so she would essentially act out and get really distressed and, and aggressive. And it was only afterwards that she'd calm down that she was able to regain her composure and explain what was, what was going on. Um, so again, here are some examples of the parents having to say, okay, if my child is, is acting this way and that's not typical, then there's probably something going on um, that, I'm, that I'm not picking up right now. So this brings me to the point of why we need autism specific GI instruments. Um, because the, the, the measurement of GI symptoms can be challenging in any population, especially in a pediatric population, um, but can be even more challenging in the autism population. And that's because, as I said, that um, many kids may go up to their parents and say, my belly hurts, my tummy hurts, or even clutch their belly and cry. Um, and that can be pretty indicative to the parent that, okay, my child's belly is hurting. But in children with autism, that's often not the default behavior. And so we can't rely on those sorts of things to tell when, um, when these kids are experiencing GI distress. Um, so for that reason, we need some GI specific, uh, autism specific tools. Um, as of 2018, there were no psychometric studies of the existing tools out there, meaning we didn't really know how they worked. We uh, researchers had designed questionnaires, but we really didn't know what the questions were measuring and how well they were measuring it and whether they were truly picking up what we wanted them to pick up. Um, and addition, in addition, the questionnaires were, were really missing some of these key items on mealtime issues, diet issues, and, and behavior that might be indicative of GI distress. Um, and I really see this as a, a hindrance to not only research and clinical care. So thankfully, there are now um, efforts underway to develop and validate parent report GI screeners. And so here on the left is a study I published a few years back kind of describing this issue. Um, and on the right here is a more recent study by some folks um, out of Columbia um, who actually developed a parent report screener for common GI disorders and autism. 
and um, there are efforts underway to to improve upon these and to study them and make sure that they can be used by parents and other individuals to to pick up when their child is is experiencing GI symptoms. Um, so now I'm going to move to how to try to identify when a person with autism may be having GI distress. Um, so the, the first obvious thing is, is verbal communication. So of course, if someone is able to directly verbalize things like, ouch, this hurts, um, my belly hurts, or even words like tummy, 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 um, sort of repeating that or repeating the question, does your tummy hurt, does your tummy hurt, does your tummy hurt? That may be an indicator that, um, that of course their, their belly is hurting. So this is sort of the most obvious um, clear cut example. The, the second type of thing which I mentioned is, is bodily signs. So this can be the lack of bowel movements or perhaps um, too many bowel movements or um, kind of loose stool like diarrhea, uh, grumbling belly, um, visible abdominal swelling. So the, you know, if you lift up the child's shirt, the, the belly seems bloated or distended. Um, so these are things that if this is going on, I think time to time to consider taking them to a physician and 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 running some more evaluations to see if something can be can be picked up because these sort of things shouldn't be happening on a routine basis, right? Um, and then, as I also mentioned, these nonverbal behaviors. And so these are this is a really broad range of things. It can be something as simple as pointing to the abdomen where the child is pointing to their stomach um, or is really sensitive to being touched in that area, perhaps because it's painful. But then it can also be some pretty nonspecific things like facial grimacing or wincing, gritting teeth, um, constantly eating or drinking or swallowing clearing their throat, even chewing on clothes. Um, and then some really sort of um, particularly nonspecific things like trying to lean against the furniture to apply pressure to their abdomen or um, some unusual posturing when they're sitting in a weird way, maybe arching their back or thrusting their jaw or kind of moving in a way that doesn't really make sense. That might be an indicator that they're trying to relieve whatever distress they're feeling. And then kind of the, the, the less specific of all is things like, you know, groaning or irritability, being aggressive or oppositional, um, sleep disturbances. If these sorts of things are happening on a routine basis and you don't know why, it could be that there's a GI or other type of medical issue that um, the person is experiencing, and this is their way of signaling that. So the next part I'll, um, I'll move to is actually how to manage these GI symptoms. And, and as I said, I'm not a medical doctor, so please don't sort of construe this as, um, misconstrue this as, as medical advice, but this is from the literature um, and from conversations and, uh, and trainings and things like that with medical doctors, but please speak to a medical doctor before changing anything. So some overall strategies to consider if you're a parent or an individual with autism, is to keep um, keep a, like a, a diary or a journal um, to take note of the behaviors that the child is using when they're communicating their symptoms. Um, also keep note of the foods that they're eating, the symptoms, um, if you're still involved in um, kind of the toileting routines, how often they're going to the bathroom, what the stool looks like, that sorts, that sort of thing. Um, this can be really helpful for trying to identify patterns. So, for example, if you're noticing, okay, every time my child is having dairy, like for the next three days, they're having a lot of diarrhea. That that would be a super obvious, super obvious pattern. And you say, okay, well, maybe maybe there's something going on with the dairy that we should look at. Um, and so, this sounds like an obvious suggestion, uh, but it's it is something that can be very helpful um, and it and can be hard to, it can be easy to miss those patterns if we're not actually writing them down. Um, and then the other point I want to make is that 
just remember that each person is a whole person and we all benefit from being able to, to move our bodies, go outside, um, eating well, being hydrated and sleeping well. And so if you know that you or your child, for example, um, is, is not drinking any water, um, is not sleeping well, is barely moving throughout the day, then those are things um, I think to target because those are gonna have important effects on GI health and, and overall health. Um, of course, some of these things are easier to do than others, um, but that is, I think, a good place to start. Um, and, and sort of the most obvious example of this is that um, we need lots of water throughout the day to, to, to not only stay hydrated, but to help our digestive system um, function optimally. And so if that's not happen, happening, um, we may be more constipated um, and that's gonna just cause sort of a cascade of different issues. And then I just wanna say that unfortunately, this is a bit of a trial and error process. So what works for one person may not work for something for someone else. It may be, it may take some iteration to, um, to you know, notice the patterns, try something and see, okay, actually this didn't make a big difference. Let's try something else. Uh, I, know, I know that process is, is frustrating, but at this point it's unfortunately kind of the name of the game. Um, in terms of dietary strategies, so um, in, an, in an effort to remove foods that seem to be um, bothering a child, sometimes diets actually become too restrictive and, and they can actually cause GI symptoms. So for example, um, if we are saying, okay, that this child seems really sensitive to vegetables and we remove all of the vegetables from the diet, then that child is probably not gonna be getting enough fiber and the other nutrients that they need. And so that may actually exacerbate their GI symptoms. So it's important to monitor, monitor this carefully. Don't remove too much at once. Um, if you try removing a food to see if that helps, um, but you're not seeing an improvement, it's best to add it back in. So you're not kind of needlessly taking things out that don't need to be removed. Um, as I've mentioned, getting the right amount of fiber is really important for maintaining gut health and minimizing symptoms. Um, and so if you or your child is having difficulty getting enough fiber through diet, something that you could look at is a supplement such as Benafiber or Citrusel. Um, these can be mixed into a drink. Um, they uh, are odorless, flavorless, they dissolve. Um, I recognize that for some people that are very sensitive, they may notice if there's something in their drink, but if you're able to mix it into a smoothie um, or a beverage that they enjoy, that can be helpful. Um, of course, start very slowly with this. Um, as I mentioned, make sure that the person is adequately hydrated. And again, not to sound like a broken record, but please work with a medical provider to do this. The other thing is to build a team. So um, some of the obvious, more obvious people might be a primary care physician, nurse practitioner, or a gastroenterologist. But please also consider working with um, a psychiatrist, looking at whether medications that they're taking may be impacting their GI symptoms, um, a nutritionist to find ways to incorporate more diversity in the diet while avoiding those foods that are really triggering. Um, a behavioral therapist can be incredibly helpful. Sometimes the issues around um, bowel movements and toiletings actually aren't necessarily because of GI symptoms or a GI dysfunction, but it could be, for example, anxiety around sitting on a toilet um, or they're withholding stool for a particular reason. And if that's the case, that's where a behavioral therapist can be incredibly helpful. And then I also encourage you to discuss potential accommodations um, for you or your child or whoever, um, you know, whoever you're working with, uh, with the school or employer and saying, you know, it's important that this person is able to use the bathroom at regular intervals or is able to have access to a water bottle, whatever the case may be, that's helpful. Um, and, and that can be really helpful in terms of managing these symptoms. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there are challenges to seeking GI care, which, um, which I've mentioned. Some of them include long wait times. There is unfortunately a shortage of providers um, in general, but specifically providers that are comfortable um, and equipped to treat children and adults with autism and co-occurring um, GI issues. 
there are financial and insurance obstacles, um, issues around medication reconciliation. Um, as I mentioned, office environments are not always conducive to people with autism. And so some of the things um, you know, that you may need to do are, is to prep a child for an anxiety inducing experience. So think about you know, the travel, the environment, what tests or procedures are gonna happen. Talk to the, to the physician um, or the provider about how to try to accommodate your child or, or your needs um, in advance. And then unfortunately, as I mentioned, sometimes um, you know, parents or people with autism are not taken seriously. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk more about this in the next slide. Um, th this issue I I of not being taken seriously because of autism, for example, is called diagnostic overshadowing. And it's literally when symptoms of, for example, a physical illness, um, like GI symptoms, let's say, are attributed to the person's neuropsychiatric neuropsychiatric or neurodevelopmental disorder, so in this case, autism. Um, this increases the risk of delayed treatment, of um, complications, and it may not be an, it's often not an intentional thing that clinicians, that some clinicians do, but it could be due to stigmatization, to negative attitudes, and I think a lot of the time to lack of education or training or confidence. Um, of course, this is not the case among all clinicians. There are so many clinicians that are truly wonderful. Um, and I'm lucky to work at Kennedy Krieger Institute where our clinicians are trained to work with this population. But I'm just speaking as sort of um, sort of just like a cautionary note to make to, to know that this happens and, and be aware of it. Um, and so an example of what this diagnostic overshadowing may look like is um, a parent that I spoke to in that qualitative study said, a lot of physicians seem uninterested. It's sort of like your child has autism, this goes with it. And this may be something you've experienced as you know, you're trying to go in to get a GI symptom or something else treated and a physician or other provider says, you know, this is just part of autism. Like that's what diagnostic overshadowing is. Um, so, so please be mindful that that unfortunately can occur. Um, and, and, and I think knowing that can help you can help you advocate for yourself or, or your family member better. Some strategies that you could use to actually work with medical providers is um, scheduling problem focused visits. Um, so just going in for a specific GI issue, for example, um, bringing things like videos or that um, that diary that I that I mentioned to show them the patterns, discuss referring to a specialist when needed. Um, again, really trying to advocate for the ad, uh, advocate for the outcome that you want, being mindful of this issue of diagnostic overshadowing. Keep in mind the, the context of autism. So for example, the, the medications that a person may be taking, the co-occurring conditions that may be affecting their GI health, but also remember to consider that perhaps GI symptoms is a distinct medical issue that may not be related to their autism. And again, talking to the medical office and the provider in advance on how to make the child or the adult more comfortable at the visit is important. So I will, um, after the talk, I will make sure to email not only the slides, but some other resources, including copies of these two papers um, that were written in 2010 by a group of experts, um, including Tom Bo uh, Tim Bowie, um, who is a pediatric gastroenterologist who specializes working with the autistic um, population and other children with neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, and they've created these, these really great reports um, for both, I think that are both useful for parents and, um, and clinicians. So I would suggest actually printing these and bringing them with you or sending them in advance. And I think that can help you advocate for, um, for getting better care. Um, and then I think importantly, uh, remain skeptical. So I think the gut brain field is a really exciting area. It's, um, it holds a lot of promise, it's growing rapidly, but we need a lot more research. And so it's important to remember that microbial therapies, for example, um, you know, restrictive diets or special diets, uh, fecal transplants, antibiotics, all of these things may have potential benefits, but they also have potential risks. And so I think it's important to remain skeptical and always consult with a trusted medical provider.
And here I've just so, shown kind of an example of when this can go awry is this was a naturopath in British Columbia who was charging um, families with a child with autism, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars for a fecal transplant that really didn't have evidence behind it. And, and that was very experimental and risky. Um, and so be mindful of this sort of thing of being taken advantage of. Um, and I know people here are really, in some cases, desperate to try to help someone or help themselves. Um, but, but just be mindful that this unfortunately can, can happen. And then the last thing I want to talk about is just um, opportunities through Spark specifically to advance the knowledge about this autism gut brain link. Um, so this first study it was published a couple of years ago, and the investigators actually used samples, uh, fecal samples from individuals with autism, and they transplanted them into mice. And some of the highlights that, um, that they found in terms of findings are that the, the mice that received the, um, the samples from the human autism versus human typically developing samples, those mice actually had um, distinct microbiomes and also exhibited autism-like behaviors. Um, the, the mice that received these autism versus typically developing microbiota also produced different um, metabolites. Um, and these different microbiomes actually affected the gene expression of genes that we know are associated with autism. So I'm not going into a, a ton of detail about this, but what I just want to say is that part of this study actually used data from Spark from families who consented to being involved in research, um, consented to sharing their genetic data in order to understand what are risk factors for autism. That data was used as part of this study. And as, as you, you may be, I think, as interested in this as I am, I think this is pretty cool seeing that, you know, these microbiomes from, from these people transplanted into the mice actually affected the mice's behavior. Um, and the expression of these genes, I think there's a lot to learn from this type of research. So that's one existing example of, I think, how Spark data um, can, can help advance the knowledge of this autism gut-brain connection. And then I also just want to briefly mention a potential future research project that I'd like to do. Um, and I am strongly considering um, using the Spark research match um, research match uh, functionality, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a second to, to do this study or some other studies. Um, as you know, and, and as we've spoken about quite a bit today, children and adults with autism may have very restrictive diets, for example, eating only these three types of food and eating them in a very particular way. Um, we know that there are some dietary interventions that exist that seem to actually increase the the diversity or variety of foods. So for example, not you know, asking people to stop eating these three, but um, working with them to try to incorporate some other options like um, whole wheat bread or peas or strawberries um, to try to improve their, their nutrition. And so one of the things that I'd like to do is study whether this improvement in the diet actually has effects on physical um, symptoms, including GI symptoms, mental health, behavioral health. And so I'm looking to Spark as a potential partner in this um, because they can help connect me with participants who are eager to, um, to be engaged in this sort of research. And that that is just, I think, an incredible resource is both for researchers like myself, but I think also for families who are interested in advancing the knowledge on, on autism. And so just a few words about Spark and um, there are folks from Spark on this meeting that can that can answer any further questions you have. Um, but Spark was started um, in 2016, and it's an initiative out of the Simons Foundation Autism Research Initiative. Um, and the mission of Spark is to recruit 50,000 individuals with autism, as well as their families, to speed up the research um, on autism and advance our understanding of autism. And it's really the first study of its kind because it's designed to be done entirely online so that anyone in the autism community can join. So I think that's uh, very convenient and makes it very special. And so 
How Spark will actually accelerate better research is that they recruit these families with autism, collect, um, collect info, including genetic info, but also phenotypic info, for example, GI symptoms. Um, they actually return the genetic results to participants so participants can learn from those and also be grouped by genetic similarities or phenotypic traits. Um, and then they help match participants to research studies like the one that I just mentioned. Um, so in terms of how to join SPARC, individuals are eligible um, if they live in the United States, uh, can read and understand English, and are either an independent adult with autism or the parent of a child or dependent adult with autism. And biological siblings are welcome as well. Um, and individuals with autism need to have a professional diagnosis of autism. And so what you can do to learn more or to register is to go online to sparkforautism.org. Um, this is where you'll consent to sharing data, entering information about your family, consenting to providing um, uh, bio samples for DNA analysis, completing surveys, and, and as I said, you will also receive the results, um, which I think is, is something really unique that this study does. That's, that's not always the case. Um, and so I think uh, Spark is really transforming the way research is done. So not only is it the largest research study of autism ever, but they are partnering with um, leading universities and centers and researchers um, across the country. Um, they are working with everyone. So not only sort of autism experts, but you uh, attendees that may be experts in living with autism or caring for someone with autism. Um, to, they're working with everyone to try to advance um, research and discovery in autism. And, um, and so your contributions really do make a difference. Um, you can participate online. It's simple. It's free. You get those results back. So um, I encourage you to, to check out that website to, to learn more. Um, and again, you can do that at sparkforautism.org um, slash KKI. So I will actually stop here. I just want to acknowledge um, Wendy Clegg Center for Autism and Developmental Disabilities at Johns Hopkins for funding some of this work, as well as the NIMH Psychiatric Epidemiology Training Program that funded, um, funded this work as well. My uh, doctoral advisor, Danny Fallon, um, Tim Bowie, who is that pediatric gastroenterologist that I, that I mentioned at Boston Children's and Harvard Medical School, um, for supplying, um, for supplying some of the info that I've shared, as well as all the partners listed here. Um, so with that, I want to thank you. Um, I'm going to stay for about half an hour to answer questions that you may have. Um, but here's my contact info. Please feel free to reach out to me after the talk. If you have more questions, I'm always happy to connect. I'm on Twitter. If you follow, um, I'm often posting things about the autism gut brain connection there. So um, I did get a chance to review a lot of the questions that, that people asked. And so I'm gonna start out with just two of them that came up a lot because I actually have some really great resources to direct you to. And as I said, you will get the final versions of these slides. So no need to jot anything down right now. But in terms of um, this question on suggesting suggestions for how to increase food variety and meet nutritional needs. The first thing that I want to point out is that Spark actually has a number of really excellent articles that outline strategies on how to address some of these feeding um, feeding issues, including picky eating um, and food selectivity. Um, so I encourage you to check those out. And then Autism Speaks developed a toolkit on feeding behavior that actually is, is kind of a self-guided toolkit um, that walks you through things to look at, um, how to start targeting these feeding behaviors, next steps to consider. Um, so instead of, instead of spending too much time um, outlining those specific strategies, I, I have referred you here to them. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is that I, I just heard of this uh, summer speaker series about by Southwest Autism Research um, and Resource Center. And um, it's, it happens August, uh, looks like August 5th 
um, to August 26. There are three different presentations. And this series is specifically designed um, to look at the fields of nutrition and brain development in autism. They'll be focusing on pertinent topics in um, nutrition, feeding and mealtime concerns, how to understand the developing brain um, in a healthy way. It's free, um, it's online, and I think this will be uh, really an excellent resource for, for people who may be interested. And I'll just point out here that Stephanie Brown is a colleague of mine at Kennedy Krieger Institute. I recently attended one of her trainings at, at the Institute and it was really wonderful. And so I think you're, you're in for a treat if you decide to attend this. Um, the second question I got a lot is suggestions on how to reduce constipation. And, and so again here, I know I mentioned some things in the talk, such as making sure that um, hydration is adequate, um, trying to increase, increase fiber intake through um, vegetables, um, sometimes having to use a, a fiber supplement like Benefiber or Citrusel. Um, but I, I also encourage you to check out, again, a, a toolkit by Autism Speaks. This is, I think, one of my favorite resources that's out there on the autism gut brain issue because it's very practical. Um, it's very well put together and it's, it's meant to target specifically this issue of constipation among children with autism. Um, and then I've also linked a number of other relevant resources here. So, um, so Spectrum has a recent, uh, has a great article and video that came out recently about the gut brain connection to autism. I recently contributed to a podcast about this through the Autism Science Foundation. Spark, again, has lots of different articles and resources available about this. I've mentioned the Autism Speaks toolkits again. I just mentioned a couple, but there are plenty more. And then there's, these are some art articles by Dr. Tim Bowie, who I mentioned, who's that pediatric gastroenterologist. So I know this might have been an information overload, and I do apologize for that but hopefully um, more resources are, are better than none. So I'm actually gonna stop there and I apologize, I went a little bit over, um, but let me stop sharing and, and see if there are any questions I can answer. Um, now, Kyla or, or Megan, do you prefer that I just go um, top to bottom here or do you, have specific questions you want me to ask first? Hi, sorry, we were we were muted by the hosts, but we're back. Um, so I think, um, first of all, thank you so much, Clyde. That was obviously a very important topic to a lot of different people. and. Um, so much good information. Um, one of the questions that came up in the chat was about gluten-free specifically or gluten-free or casein-free diet. So if you had any information or any resources on that specific um, sort of intervention for folks. Yeah, that's a great question and, and a popular one. Um, so there is um, currently no real strong evidence that a gluten-free or a casein-free diet helps with symptoms of autism. Um, that being said, it, it is true that some people who try a gluten-free or casein-free diet do have improvements in GI symptoms and may also have improvements in behavioral symptoms. So the research is really inconclusive at this time. So I can't recommend that everyone try it for that reason, but I will say if you're following the strategies that I outlined, keeping a food log, um, and a symptom log, and if you see a pattern related to gluten or casein or dairy, um, you know, something to try could be to eliminate one of those foods one at a time and to keep tracking the symptoms, see if there is any improvement for you or your child. Um, and if that's the case, then, then yes, probably removing that food may be helpful in terms of GI and maybe other related symptoms as well. Um, if after, a uh, a month or I think at the maximum three months, if you're removing that food and you don't see any difference, then I would suggest actually putting it back in because again, you don't wanna be removing things that you don't have to remove. 
Um, and this is one of the areas where I think it's really helpful to work with a nutritionist um, or a behavioral therapist to try to make sure that you're keeping as many foods as possible in the diet um, while removing the ones that may be, um, that may be triggering. Great, thank yeah. you. Um, another question that came up in the chat was specific maybe to more of our local families about Kennedy Krieger. And if you know if Kennedy Krieger has any GI specialists that are spe specifically working with folks in the autism community. It's a great question. And I know this was also one that, that was submitted in advance. Um, at present, I don't have a list of names ready to give you, but I promise this is on my task list for the week. Um, I just joined KKIS faculty, and so I'm still making some of those connections, but I'm going to be talking to the medical doctors that I know and other providers that I work with to find out um, who are the people um, that, that we should be referring folks to. And so I promise I will follow up and, and circulate that information as soon as I have it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, and this question actually came up bef um, sent in before the presentation. It was a popular one, I think, and you talked about it a little bit, but just to go into um, probiotics, do, you, yeah. do probiotics help with GI and ASD symptoms or just have you had any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, so like the special diets, um, we unfortunately don't have a ton of evidence about whether um, whether probiotics are really beneficial for autism and behavioral symptoms. Um, but we do see some evidence that they help with GI symptoms. Um, now, a, a few notes about just probiotics is that because they're sold as supplements, the FDA doesn't actually check them for safety or health claims that they make. So it's important that when you're selecting a probiotic, um, you do a few things. The first is that you want to think about what specifically you're targeting. Are you targeting constipation? Are you targeting abdominal pain? Are you targeting mood? Um, as much as possible, try to Google that, Google that probiotic and see, has there been research actually done on it? And, and what are people saying? Um, so the label should, the label of the probiotic that you buy should tell you specifically what bacteria are in that probiotic. And they should tell you the amounts of that bacteria. If that information is missing, do not bother trying because it's not even telling you what's in the product. Um, the, the other thing is that probiotics should have at least 1 billion CFUs. Now CFU stands for colony forming unit. Um, and this is just a metric of how much of the bacteria, the live bacteria are in the product. So the more, the better. And the reason is because some of those bacteria are going to die um, in the process of being on the shelf and in the process of actually working through the digestive system. So you want something with at least a billion CFUs. Um, something else to consider is that um, it may be helpful to take a probiotic with a prebiotic. So remember the prebiotics are the actual foods that probiotics need to, to reproduce and thrive. Um, and so make sure that as much as possible, you're adding enough fiber to the diet. Fiber is a prebiotic that feeds these bacteria. That's gonna make, um, that's gonna increase the chances that the probiotic is successful. Um, and, you know, although you can get um, these probiotics mostly over the counter um, and they don't require prescription, I really would encourage you to work with a physician um, or a dietitian to find an ideal one, ask them what they recommend and work with them to monitor because, of course, it's something that you're putting in the body and it may have side effects. Um, and on that note, consider starting off slowly um, because you are introducing bacteria and those may not be present um, in abundance in, in the person's gut. Um, there can be some initial digestive side effects. So be sure to really start out slowly um, and make sure that the person is tolerating those well. Um, the only one that I know really for having some evidence of clinical uh, efficacy is called um, Viz Biome. That's V-I-S-B-I-O-M-E. Um, this was previously known as VSL number three, um, but is now known as VizBiome. 
Um, so that's one I think worth asking your, your physician about. Great. Um, in your presentation, you talked a little bit about how the parent sort of GI reporting screeners are not uh, where we want them to be maybe yet. They're not super, we don't know yet if they're measuring what we want them to measure. Um, can you just re, sort of re-speak on some of the research that's going into the screeners? Sure. So um, in, let's say, a typically developing child that is able to walk up to their parents and say, mom or dad, my belly hurts, um, that is a signal, of course, to the parent that, okay, my child's belly hurts. I need to figure out what's going on. Maybe it's something they ate. I'm going to monitor them, perhaps bring them to the doctor if it's not going away. Um, so that's kind of the simplest example. Um, in a lot of cases with children with autism, um, since that verbal communication may not be happening, then we have to rely on other things. As I mentioned, things like bodily signs, like stool um, and gas, but also nonverbal behaviors like irritability or aggression. And so the, the GI screeners or questionnaires that are being developed are not only asking about sort of the obvious things, like does your child tell you that their stomach is, is bothering them, but it includes other items like, is your child acting a certain way? Are they irritable? Are they having sleep issues? Um, are they drinking a ton of water or chewing on their clothes? Things that don't necessarily mean that there's a GI problem going on, but indicate that there could be a GI problem going on. So what we do is we use those types of items as well as items about diet, like is your child avoiding particular foods? And we create a questionnaire that includes all of those things. And then if we're finding that, you know, a parent or a person is endorsing a lot of those things, then that may be a signal that a more comprehensive evaluation may be needed. And so it's not necessarily that we're going to use these screeners to say, okay, if your child does X, Y, Z, then yes, they definitely have reflux. That's not really the case, but it could be that it signals that there is something going on with the gut and it points you in the direction of, um, of sort of next steps. Now, as I said, that's still very much in development. Um, and, you know, at, at this point, I would still encourage people to just keep track of symptoms and how you know that your child is communicating when they're in distress and, and use that as an indicator. But my hope is that in, in the short, near short term, um, we'll be able to have more of these validated tools to use in research and, and clinically. Great. Um, here's an interesting question that came from the chat, and maybe you have some information about where folks could look for more information on this, but sure. is, this person asks, has there been any research on changing GI symptoms um, during puberty or after puberty related specifically for females and hormones that come up during puberty? It's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately not aware of any of that research, and um, part of it is because we know very little, unfortunately, about autism in general, but including GI issues in anything but the pediatric population. And so there are starting to be studies where we look at what symptoms are present and how frequent they are and how severe they are in the adolescent period and uh, in puberty and, and then in adulthood and even older age. Um, but at present, we just don't have that research to really um, to really know that, um, let alone is it different, you know, across across sex. Um, that being said, we know that, of course, in um, in any menstruating menstruating individual, um, you know, PMS or having a period can be associated with GI distress. So I think it's reasonable to expect um, that in those individuals, if they are having a period, those may be associated with um, with more GI symptoms. That's certainly very true in the general population as well. Um, so that that's certain to, certainly something to look out for, especially if you're someone um, who has just started menstruating or it's your child that's just started menstruating and you're seeing a, a, a change in GI symptoms, that could certainly be what's going on. And I would encourage you to not only reach out to a gastroenterologist, but also um, a gynecologist to, to figure out how to, how to manage those symptoms. Thank you. Um, another question about that you might or might not have the answer to just about resources or people looking for more information or even research on food sensitivities. I know 
Um, you mentioned the Spark website as a great resource and some other resources. Um, and you said you were going to send those out. So I'm sure people will get access to those. But if you just had any thoughts where people might look for um, more research on those types of issues. Yeah, I, so I definitely would would start. Um, there were quite a few links on there and then that Autism Speaks Toolkit. The other thing is that I'll just make a, a plug for Kennedy Krieger here. They really have a wonderful team of nutritionists and, um, and behavioral therapists and other providers that work specifically on these sorts of issues. So um, if you're not already being seen at KKI, um, I would encourage you to, you can go to the website and get, pro get, um, get started on that that intake and referral process and and hopefully get connected with with the right sort of providers. Um, but I appreciate that getting connected with providers can always take some more time than we want, unfortunately. Um, so that's why I think the, those links that I shared in the slides can be can be particularly helpful because you can really start them right now. Great, thank you. And then um, it looks like one of our last questions. Uh, there could be a few more rolling in, but one of them is other than probiotics, and you mentioned maybe a fiber supplement, are there other supplements that not that you would recommend, because I know you're not a doctor, but that you think there's research on that people should investigate for themselves? The yeah, one that was brought up specifically was lactulose, which I have not heard of, but that's what uh, Yeah, another good question, and, and unfortunately, there's no evidence here. So um, that, that is not to say that different vitamins or supplements wouldn't help but we just don't have the evidence that say that they do. So it's still inconclusive. Um, lactulose, I believe is used in helping digest dairy. Um, so if you are, um, you know, if you know that there is a dairy sensitivity and that lactulose helps with those symptoms, then certainly um, I think that's something worth, worth trying um, or, or using kind of on a, um, a long-term basis if that's appropriate medically. Um, you know, aside from that, what I'll just say about vitamins and supplements is it's, it's always best to, to try to get those nutrients in, um, in the diet, but if you're not able to get them in the diet, then trying, um, you know, working with a physician to try something like a multivitamin or supplements that target the various vitamins and minerals that you're missing, um, that, that could be helpful. Uh, again, there's not strong research to, to demonstrate that, but I think it's worth talking to a provider about if you know that there are these big gaps in the diet. Great, thank you, Clyphe. Um, just as one final note, um, just to sort of reiterate what Clyphe said about Spark, um, sort of one of the, you know, the whole goal of Spark is to just help speed up autism research just because we don't know enough about autism. And one of the key ways that Spark is sort of involved in expanding the knowledge around autism is gathering insight and data um, to help sort of figure out what's going on with these issues that are so often seen with, in folks with autism, including GI issues, which is just why this type of research and then the partners that Spark makes um, are also important for just sort of building our knowledge about, um, about these types of topics. So um, thank you, Clyde P. I don't see any more questions rolling in. Um, I, I think Megan and perhaps Bonnie put our information in the in the chat. So if anyone has any specific e uh, questions about Spark, you can feel free to email us. If you have any questions about GI issues, I know uh, Clive you put her information in the in the slides. So um, I'm sure she she'll reach out if or you can reach out and get a response if it's something that she can answer. Um, so just thank you again, and I want to thank Pathfinders as well for hosting this and everyone for joining. Um, it was obviously an important topic. We had a lot of people in here, so I'm happy that we could um, sort of share this information with everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone.